The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Peninsula residential rents are skyrocketing right along with housing prices. Two cities are voting on rent control measures. Will they solve the problem or make it worse? We talked to both sides of the controversial issue. The game is politics. The game is on. Hi, I'm Kevin Mullen. And I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to the game. For a host of reasons, rent control has never taken hold on the peninsula. But with the booming housing market has come rent increases that some tenants, including school teachers, service workers, and public employees, say is forcing them out of their homes. After months of debate, including efforts to resolve the issue by community task forces, Two rent control measures were put on this November's ballot, Measure Q in San Mateo and Measure R in Burlingame. We are joined by two opposing advocates on this volatile issue. On the yes side, we have Daniel Saver, senior attorney in the housing practice at Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto, where he represents renters on the full range of landlord-tenant issues. Mr. Saver is credited as the principal author of the two rent control ballot measures facing voters in San Mateo and Burlingame. And from is Joshua Howard, Senior Vice President for Northern California for the Northern for the California Apartment Association, an organization representing apartment owners. He is responsible for the association's regional, legislative, and political action advocacy. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Let me start with a general question. Uh, I, I, do we all acknowledge that rising rents are a problem? and that it needs to be solved here on the peninsula. Let's start with the guy who's supposed to be representing those who are charging some of these rents. Sure, well, I think it's no, um, it's not news that housing prices have gone up as the economy has rebounded. We've come back from the worst recession since the Great Depression, and we've seen job growth in Northern California skyrocket. Uh, San Mateo County has one of the lowest unemployment rates in California, if not the nation. Uh, today, it was announced that GDP growth exceeded all expectations. Yet, unfortunately, our cities have not permitted enough housing to meet the growing demand. Uh, San Mateo County alone, in the period of 2007 to 2014, only permitted 53% of the housing units it planned to build. If you want to look closer at these two cities of San Mateo and Burlingame, city of Burlingame only permitted 16% of the units they planned to build in a seven-year period, and in San Mateo, it was 39%. We're falling woefully short of the housing that we need for our families, for workers, for people in our community, and until we can solve the housing crisis with an adequate number of homes, then we will not have enough affordable housing for everyone, and we'll continue to see this vexing issue confront us. So, so Daniel, if I can summarize fairly, yes, rent, rent are, are going up, but they're driven as much by market forces as anything else. Is that your view of it as well, or is there something else going on? Well, I think there's a number of things going on, and I, I think it's important to say, you know, what, whatever the causes are, this is exactly what people are experiencing. If we're talking about the, the lives of the residents that live within these communities, you know, to them, whether it's because Burlingame permitted units or San Mateo permitted units, that's not the way that this is hitting them. The way that it's hitting them is with rent increases of $600 all at once. Uh, we even have folks getting over $1,000 rent increases. That's actually the pain and the suffering that is happening in our communities. It's forcing lots of people out. So, so I do think that there certainly is a problem with a lack of supply. Additionally, one thing we're seeing, though, I think, is uh, an increase in speculation in the real estate market here in San Mateo County. So part of this is driven by the really high demand and the lack of supply, but what's happening is it's not just your mom and pop landlords who have owned for 30 years and have kept, kept rents reasonable and have known their tenants you know, for decades. What we're seeing is outside money coming from all over the place. You know, Wall Street, uh, we're seeing foreign money come in where these investors are snatching up buildings and immediately evicting everyone or immediately increasing rents by six, seven hundred, a thousand dollars. So yes, it's in part driven by the lack of supply, 
but there are other forces at work here that I think demonstrate the need for some sort of regulation so that we can keep things a little bit more sane. Jo Joshua, what you'll hear in, in the most, putting it in the most negative sense is, how can you in good conscience raise rents by X? Right. Um, and well, and I think, what's I your response what's, to some of what Daniel was saying? I think what's important to note is for the better part of a year and a half, housing advocates, tenant advocates, the business community were brought together. Uh, City of San Mateo brought together a task force that was very diverse with Mr. Saver served on it, I served on it, um, Chamber of Commerce, other uh, faith-based organizations, other business groups and community leaders. During those five to six months of discussions of the task force, there was agreement on some issues, but every time the issue came up to try to address what was happening in the rental housing market, the answer from the tenant advocates was no. Property owners and the California Apartment Association offered mandatory mediation to resolve landlord-tenant disputes. Tenant advocates said no. They offered long-term leases to protect renters from getting multiple rent increases in one year or from being evicted without cause. Tenant advocates said no. We offered longer notice periods to allow families to adjust to uh, a rent increase or if they had to move. Tenant advocates said no. We offered relocation assistance to disincentivize large rent increases, and the tenant advocates said no. It was rent control or bust. So, so in other words, what you're thinking was the, the, the whole purpose of the task force was to end up with rent control, not to find a reasonable solution. No, the whole purpose saying? of the task force was to find compromise and to find no, reasonable but the, solutions. But the participation of, of the tenant advocates, you're saying, was they weren't interested in solving the problem. They were interested only in establishing rent control. Yes, and that was evidenced at the city council meeting when they none of them showed up when there were reasonable solutions to be debated. They opposed those solutions because they were short of rent control. So there was no willingness to engage in dialogue or engage in anything short of rent control. So it becomes very difficult to have this conversation and um, try to negotiate when one party is not willing to negotiate. Rent control or bust, is that what you were doing? So, so no, I, 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 with all due respect, disagree with the characterization that Josh put on this process. I mean, I think, you know, taking a step back, we have to try and figure out, like, what's really going on here? I mean, what I just described in terms of the pain and suffering in the community, I mean, as you said, is it really a question anymore that we're in a housing crisis? You know, I think there's broad consensus that we're in a housing crisis and that rents are going up way too fast and the fact that people are being pushed out is not the way that we want to form our communities. And I think there's a sense of like, geez, we're all suffering, right? Like we're all dealing with the traffic as people drive over from Tracy. Geez, we're all dealing with these really high housing prices. All of us are kind of feeling pain, right? Well, no. Actually, there's a small group of people who are profiting off of the crisis. So a lot of us are feeling pain. I think the vast majority of residents in this county are feeling some pain and seeing their neighbors feel pain. There's a small group of people who are actually making money. The landlords are making a killing. Aren't they allowed to make money? Aren't they Absolutely, sure they? yeah. And, and I think nobody, and I certainly don't want to say, they shouldn't be able to make a profit. You know, I think it's one thing to say, though, that we want to be able to make a reasonable profit, a reasonable return on our investment, and we want to rent gouge people, and we want to speculate off of the, the difficulties that people are living. That, to me, is a completely different question. I think we've been very interested in pursuing a range of solutions. I mean, look, you know, rent stabilization is not the silver bullet. We don't think it is. There is no silver bullet. You know what? The, the housing crisis is very complex. It needs, it has multiple factors at its cause, and we need to have a multi-pronged set of solutions to get after it. We absolutely need to increase the supply of housing. We absolutely need to increase the supply of affordable housing. We also need to stop the displacement that's currently shredding our community apart. And Damn. building housing, building affordable housing, isn't going to stop displacement. Let me, let me take, we're gonna to have to take a break. Hold those thoughts though, and you stick around. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage.
Welcome back to The Game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. We're talking about measures Q and R, the rent control measures in San Mateo and Burlingame. And we're joined by Joshua Howard from the California Apartment Association and Daniel Saver from the Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto. Um, Kevin, you had a follow-up question. Daniel, I just wanted to, at the top of the second segment here, just have you describe the provisions of these two measures in Burlingame and San Mateo, and are there differences between the two? And I'm curious what some of the dynamics are in terms of dealing with Burlingame and San Mateo. Some folks outside the peninsula think these are very similar communities, but describe who we're talking about here, who's going to be affected. Yeah, uh, great question. So the, the short answer is that the measures are more similar than they are different. And I think a key way of understanding what are these measures really doing, uh, there's two main things that they're doing. They're addressing the exorbitant rent increases and they're also addressing arbitrary evictions. So I think a key to understand what these measures do is to understand what's the law now? How does it work now without these? And when it comes to rents, the current law is that landlords are allowed to increase the rent as much as they want, as often as they want, and all they have to do is give the tenant a written notice. And they never need to give more than 60 days notice. So if they increase your rent $300, there's a notice. If they increase your rent $1,000, nothing more than a 60 day notice. Similarly for evictions, the current law is that if you're a month to month tenant, landlords can evict you for any reason or no reason at all, and they don't even have to tell you the reason why they're evicting you. As long as it's not retaliation or discrimination, mm -hmm. there's no limit whatsoever. And again, as a, as a tenant, you're not even entitled to know why. Landlord can just give you 60 days and say move out, even if you've lived there for 25 years and paid rent on time. So what these measures do, both measures Q, both measure Q and measure R, <coughs> would limit, they would slow down the rate of rent increases. So they only regulate rent increases, not the initial rent that a landlord charges. So once you negotiate your lease with the landlord and you start by paying $2,000, that's set by the market. Thereafter, the amount of any increase would be limited to the rate of inflation. So you have some stability and predictability. But there's a cap of 1% to 4%. So this assumes, you know, if the rate of inflation is 5, you can't go that high. That so is correct. Who, who are the typical renters? Who are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think your typical renters are, you know, working class, middle class families who are really, at this point, are really struggling to stay in our communities. I mean, as a general rule, renters are tend to be lower income, lower wealth than their homeowner counterparts. Um, and so what we're really trying to do with these measures is you know, target those folks who are most struggling now with the current crisis, um, and who are the folks who really most need that help. So jo Josh, I, I know you want to, <laughs> let me also ask you, everybody, this sort of a cliche view of landlords, um, but who are these, these people? They're not all speculators, they're not all guys just trying to get rich. Who are some of these landlords? Because clearly your, your position's gonna be that some of them, well, this is gonna be a real hardship for them. Well, this is a real hardship. I mean, when <clears throat> most rental property owners in San Mateo County are not Wall Street interests, they're not major investors, they are average residents who are working full-time jobs, trying to put their kids through school, trying to save for retirement, and have invested in a fourplex, have invested in an eight unit building, and wanted to find ways to invest in their community, not just in their 401k or their 529. Um, what we have is we have individuals who are looking to make a difference in their community, provide quality housing, and the average, to your question, rental property owner is someone who owns fewer than five units, someone who's in their you know, mid 30s to mid 70s, and has li lives and works in this region. And what measures Q and R would do is take away that investment and that that they've made in their community. Um, but I think what's important to really understand is measures Q and R, while well intentioned, are very poorly drafted, and go far beyond what the proponents claim of providing the so-called notion of stability to renters in these two cities. Measures Q and R are going to cost the city of San Mateo two and a half million dollars a year, cost the city of Burlingame over a million dollars a year, set up unaccountable, unelected commissions that have the power to set the rules and regulations for how these laws are administered if they pass, set the rules and regulations as to how money can be spent, and they have the power to assess fees on the community, not just on rental property owners, but on the entire community, and they have the ability to take money from the city's general fund for their own purposes that they deem necessary. So we've set up a, a separate, what they do is they set up a separate 
bureaucracy within the city that's not accountable to the city council, not accountable to the city manager, has its own staff, and has the ability to spend whatever funds it deems necessary for its purposes. Okay. Daniel, we'll get to that part of it in a second, but I want to I ask you, on the face of it, limiting someone to 1% to 4% rent increases on an annual basis sounds reasonable. Tell, tell me why it's not. Well, let's look at what um, happens under rent control. What happens under rent control and what's flawed in these measures, there's no guarantee that the school teacher who makes below 80% AMI, there's no guarantee that the service worker or the public safety officer who serves the community is going to get the benefits of a rent controlled unit. There's no income test to ensure that those who need the so-called benefits of rent stabilization the most actually receive it. And we can have instances where renters with very strong incomes will get rent controlled housing, take that rent controlled unit off the market from someone who truly needs it. And this has been documented by the state of California where a legislative analyst even wrote that rent control creates what's called the lock-in effect where a renter with high income will get into a unit and then not move out because they have the benefit of price stability, so thereby it, preventing so, someone. So it's not the cap that's bothering you as much as what it how it locks in certain rates. We're, we're going to get to all this when we come back from a break, but I don't give me a chance. The 1% to 4% question is the one I asked you. It sounds like you don't think that's the real issue. Well, the real issue here is that these measures, number one, do not address the real issue of affordable housing. They do not guarantee that those who need housing the most will receive it. They protect bad tenants at the expense of good renters, and they're going to cost the city over $2 million a year in San Mateo, over a million in Burlingame, to regulate a finite number of housing units. When the real issue here is making sure we have quality housing and sensible policies in place, such as the ones we've offered and I talked about earlier, but that have always been rejected by the other side. Well, Daniel's going to take a deep breath and prepare a response uh, once we come back from a break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. Over here we have Joshua Howard from the California Apartment Association and Daniel <coughs> Saver from the Committee of Legal Services of East Palo Alto. We are talking about measures Q&R in San Mateo and Burlingame. I think it's safe to say these are real battleground issues about whether or not rent control is going to take hold in a county like San Mateo County where I think it would have been regarded as one of the last bastions against uh, imp implementing something like this. Daniel, we had quite a, a, a detailed uh, comment by Joshua, and we promised you a chance to respond to some of the things you said. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, particularly because I think this is a great opportunity for the viewers at home to do some fact checking. Um, so I want to address a couple things that Josh said, particularly related to the cost and the way that that works. And then the second is with means testing. So with, with cost, uh, this is a great fact check. Go on to the city of Burlingame and the city of San Mateo's website. Go on to the county's elections website and find the links to the independent reports that the city of San Mateo and the city of Burlingame both commissioned to analyze measures Q and R. Look at those reports and you will see that in those reports commissioned by the city, they confirmed that these two measures are financed by a fee on landlords not a tax. They don't have the power to tax. That's just factually incorrect. They do not have the power to assess a fee on anyone other than a landlord who is participating in the program. Those are actually just straight up factual issues, I think. Um, we've seen a lot of misinformation about this out in the community. Uh, and I think that, you know, I'd really encourage viewers and voters to actually straight up look at the facts of how that works. Um, these will not impact the general fund. The reason why the apartment association, which represents landlords, is so opposed to these is because they would have to pay the costs. It does not go to the taxpayers. I think that's really critical. 
The second thing related to means testing, you know, the argument is, look, you can have some really wealthy person making well, well over six figures in a rent control department. Two thoughts. Number one, I would ask my counterpart here, you know, if, so Prop 13 offers stability to homeowners. That's not means tested, right? You have homeowners, you have apartment owners, you have big landlords who get the benefits of Prop 13 who are making a ton of money and there's no means testing there. Why are we applying a double standard to renters? So we're letting these really wealthy property owners and landlords get all the benefits of other government policies, but somehow we're going to treat renters differently. I think that's very unfair. Well, this, let's, let's well let him answer that question right what now. What I think is important to recognize is those two independent reports that Mr. Saver cited yes, outline the cost of the program, but also outline the costs for starting up the rent control bureaucracy. And the city is required to front the money to establish the rent control bureaucracy, hiring the staff, doing the legal work, setting up the information technology program, setting up the rules and regulations, getting the commission up and running. There's no guarantee that the expenses for those startup investments will ever be recovered from the commission or from property owners. So that's what I would disagree. Again, I would just really encourage the viewers to look, go look at the ordinance. I mean, the, or, the language is there online. You can look at it. The, the language of measures Q and R specifically says that the program will be financed by fees. It does say it is absolutely true that the city has to front <coughs> those costs. That can be done as a loan to the program. And the program will have to pay those loans off to the city. Now, if the city chooses to subsidize the program out of the general fund, that's up to the cities. There's there's absolutely no authority or requirement that the city use its general fund or taxpayer dollars to fund the program. Okay, I, I'm going to ask you both to put your political analyst hat on. A lot of money being uh, poured into this, uh, primarily on the no side, mostly on the no side, uh, on, the, on the two measures. What is going to be um, the turning point in this election? What will decide this election? Is it as simple as how many renters turn out to vote? or is it homeowners who um, are now uh, finally realizing the impact of rent increases? What, what is going to decide this election? Because I think the view is if, these, if either of these were to pass in San Mateo County, that there may be a ripple effect across the region or across the state. Just talk about some of the election dynamics, if you can. Well, I think it's important to note that measures Q and R are very complex and they are very difficult pieces of policy that cannot be simplified into sound bites, cannot be simplified, um, and the voters need to understand the entire ramifications of measures Q and R. And they also need to understand that measure R in Burlingame uh, potentially would rescind a law on the books that provides protections to homeowners, provides protections to homeowners from having the government be able to regulate the price for which a single family home can be bought and sold. So I think it's important that the campaign has had to focus on educating the voters about how complex and how onerous measures Q and R actually are. And it's evidence that these two policies are that complex when you have two members of the San Mateo community who now regret signing the petition for measure Q. Former Mayor Claire Mack has come out and said, if I had read the entire thing, I wouldn't have signed the petition for measure That's Q. That's always a great admission to make, isn't it? And is now if I understood all that was in Measure Q, I would have not signed it and is now one of the primary opponents of Measure Q and one of the signature gatherers after reading more about Measure Q decided to stop collecting signatures and is campaigning against Measure Q. So I think to your point, once the voters realize and are educated on how far reaching Q and R actually are and are far more than a rent stabilization scheme as they're presented, they will uh, vote no. So, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the short answer here is whether the voters are able to see through the more than a million dollars that the landlords and special interest groups are throwing at this. So, you know, this, this is a real David and Goliath battle. You know, this is grassroots community organizations and residents who have been feeling the pain in the community who have had to go to the ballot because special interests have such a stranglehold on local politics in these cities, uh, and they're throwing millions of dollars to protect their profits. I think ultimately this comes down to whether or not the voters are gonna be swayed by the mailers that are coming through and the TV ads that they see, or whether they're gonna notice at the bottom of all of those ads that it says something like funded by the apartment association read landlords. You know, these are people who are potentially going to have their profits curtailed. I think that's a really critical piece. Uh, and the other thing I think, honestly, is just, you know, 
I actually really disagree with the characterization that, that Josh put on this. I think these are really straightforward measures. You know, look, if you think a $1,000 rent increase is unjust, you believe in a form of rent stabilization. If you think somebody who's paid rent every day for 20 years in their home shouldn't be evicted for no reason, you believe in having some limitations on evictions. You believe in measures Q and R if those things are true, and I think we just need to be able to get voters to see through the, the mess and the hot air. Let me ask, we're running low on time, so let me ask for a sh relatively short answer. <laughs> if it doesn't pass, if these measures don't pass, are you going to put another measure on the ballot two years from now, or are you going to go back to see if this task force is, can't be re reformed and worked out? We're going to continue working, and ultimately this, comes, this is up to the members of each individual community. You know, measures Q and R were not started by me. They were started by folks in San Mateo and Burlingame who needed a solution. I think people are going to keep looking for solutions whether these win or lose. Josh, are you worried this is, this is just the beginning of this debate? We have just a few seconds. No, this is, this is about beginning a true conversation about how can we get more housing built in our communities? How can we reform laws like CEQA? How can we help educate homeowners and longtime community members about the benefits of high-density transit-oriented development? And the California Apartment Association is steadfastly committed to working towards overcoming those regulatory burdens, streamlining, streamlining the permit process, and getting more funding for affordable housing. Thank you. Joshua Howard, Daniel Saver, thank you for being with us. I'm Mark Simon. I'm Kevin Mullen. And thank you for being with us. Join us on our live election night show. Both of these gentlemen have said they'll be here to either claim victory or explain defeat. And we'll hope to see you then. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Game.